My grandparents lived in a trailer park in Florida for most of my childhood. It's a place that acts as a gigantic basin for some of my happiest childhood memories. I'm sorry I'm sick if I sound like crap. I remember playing shuffleboard at a faded court on long, hot summers. I remember when my sister and I would borrow three-wheeled bicycles on the 4th of July. I remember wrecking that same bicycle trying to be funny, and the collection of scrapes that formed on my knee resembling the same fireworks that shot over our heads that day. I remember visiting my great-grandmother, who also lived there until she died when I was in college. Never underestimate the resilience of tiny Protestant women born just north of the Ohio River. I remember visiting my Uncle Harless, that's a nickname, and his parakeet buddy, his Christian name, uh, the sweetest man who really just loved the presence of children. I think he really missed his. They're all grown up. He's struggling with his health right now. I haven't seen him in years at this point. I remember the trailer park's cat, Jake, his black and white short-haired stray my grandfather took in, who would come when called and drooled more than any cat I've ever met. For those who have met my handsome and brilliant son, Otis, who was also a stray, who grew to love and trust people. Jake served a similar role to the people around him. Lovable, sweet, gentle, reformed street cat who never lost the need to be outside, who never met a varmint he couldn't stalk and kill. We don't really know what happened to Jake, he just kind of disappeared one day. My grandpa looked for him for a good while, I think, but I mean, I'm pretty sure we all just kind of knew. Jake probably died. Since he lived the life of a street cat, he died in a blink before we got a chance to say goodbye. And it's sad, but it's a part of life and a risk you take by loving animals who live outside. And really the most heartbreaking part is how universal this feeling is, I think. You know how even when loved ones get sick, they get better, they get sick again, and they pass away. Even how these long and painful journeys feel like a passing moment you can't grasp until it's already disappeared. How life cruelly flashes by us if we have the audacity to just blink, even for a second. Blink, and he has pain in his hips from the cancer. Blink, and the remission is over, the cancer is back. Blink, and he's held on for Christmas to meet his great-grandson, even for a moment. And then blink, and he's gone. Free of pain, on to whatever is after this. Nothing, everything, I don't know. I don't longer know precisely what to do with my memories. As someone who thinks about memory quite a bit, <laughs> memories that are, you know, when a loved one passes, suddenly filled with this sort of mix of joy and pain. New regret that emerges from the realization that someone important to you is gone for good. Memories that serve as a point by which I can evaluate my life and think critically about myself and how I treat others and what I'm doing with my short time in this world. It's awful. <laughs> There's this strange cultural discursive reflex to treat this kind of melancholy as evidence of pure defeat, some kind of pure negation, rather than a weight against the regulating horizons of liberalism that keep our vision for the future so small. In light of so much that I've seen, and because of what I find to be the idealistic liberatory functions of memory, there's a happy ending waiting to be wrought out from its confined space in this newly catalyzed series of memories. And I would wager that if we're to reconnect ourselves with a sense of history more idealistic, more romantic, more emergent, something I've argued in favor of here in the past one way or another. This is a video in part about Before Your Eyes. I will be doing my best to stay overall spoiler free, but there's no such thing as completely spoiler free analysis. I think you should go play this game or skip ahead to the next part. I'll put a timestamp in the description. Before Your Eyes is a game about a trip into the past. You, the protagonist, you visually narrate a series of fragmented partial memories using your first person perspective to illuminate visions of your childhood experiences after you're fished out of a sea of souls and begin your journey toward the afterlife, a journey in which you recount the story of your life to a gatekeeper that determines your eternal fate. Its central mechanic uses your webcam to detect your blinks, and when an eye appears somewhere on screen, you glance over and blink to see some previously hidden aspect of this particular memory. 
And when this metronome appears on screen and you blink, the game jumps forward in time, whether you're ready or not, whether you intended to or not. Characters will stop mid-sentence, and you lose anywhere from hours to years in a single moment. Before your eyes is a humble reminder of the fragility of our own memories, how when we're honest about our own limitations and perspective, our poor tendencies, and our worst moments, even when we ourselves are confronted by the wild cruelty that life brings towards so many, despite all of this, we're able to live on in the hearts of our loved ones, and that even the most fragile among us can have impacts that outlive our short and small lives. Its message of hope is refreshingly honest and necessarily critical. It's a game that truly understands that we ourselves are ushering in the grander schemes by which change is brought into the world and history is therefore rendered. Because the key to this is the power of memory. Memory as a fragmented and indelible concept. Memory as emotionally impactful because of its simultaneously intimate and structural qualities. Memory as an affirmation that despite being so small, our personal stories overflow with affective, rich meaning. Before Your Eyes is not a simple, linear journey through someone's life, but an exploration of the ways in which we as human agents use memory to form our world. How history as a product of human consciousness doesn't exist outside of that consciousness. And therefore, we are the ones who make and construct history. We tell our stories. As you make your way through the game, there is always someone interpreting and recounting a narrative that you do not and cannot fully explain, lest you no longer be yourself. When our stories, memories, histories are not interpreted, they are cast into a sea of souls and remain floating in this primordial soup until someone comes along and fishes them out, interprets them, and then places them among the towering spire of history. Before Your Eyes is an investment in the critique of simple personal histories as perfect reflections of the absolute lived experience, an infantilizing historicism that places primacy on the affirmations and resiliencies of individuality while sacrificing agency at the altar of absolute contingency. Your journey through life in this game moves back and forth across time, visually illustrates the limitations of your perspective places doubt in the reliability of your own assuredly accurate depiction of the events in your life, and using all of this to remind us that not only is memory the stuff of beautiful human fiction, stories by which we interpret and change the world, but also that we can be extraordinarily larger than the sum of our parts, that present in the imminent melancholy of our limitations as individuals is the affirmation that to be one of many is to have taken your rightful place among the actors of revolutionary history. You can't live in New York City on what they're giving us. I've been told I'm eligible for welfare, but I don't want to take welfare. We want to work, but this is the only means we have of letting Congress know that we cannot take it any longer. Either they give us what we should have, or we will stay out on strike until hell freezes over. If you read one book this year, it should be The Road to Blair Mountain by Chuck Keeney. Chuck is an historian and professor of history at Southern West Virginia Community and Technical College and also the great-grandson of Frank Keeney, a union organizer and one of the belligerents in the West Virginia Mine Wars. Beginning around 1912 and continuing into 1920, various organized coal miners and their bosses came into often bloody and violent conflict. Among those conflicts, including the Battle of Blair Mountain, an armed conflict that quickly became the largest armed labor uprising in U.S. history, and in the case of the Mine Wars, part of the deadliest events on U.S. soil since the Civil War. At the time, performing the most dangerous work in the entire country would fetch workers payment in the form of company scrip and wage reductions, among other things, and when workers banded together to fight back against this extreme exploitation, they were met with armed strike breakers and the force of the U.S. National Guard coming to the defense of coal barons. Keeney's book is only partially about the mine wars, it actually centers on a new conflict. In 2001, Chuck and a group known as the Friends of Blair Mountain uh, began their own fight to preserve the battlefield 
associated with the famous Battle of Blair Mountain as an historical landmark, uh, basically standing up to modern big coal in the process, bringing this historic conflict roaring back into the present via a vision for a better future that they won after years of deep organizing, uh, elbow greasery, and by using a strategy that committed themselves to winning from the bottom up as civil advocates. Because of their hard work, because of their commitment to a shared goal, events that had probably in many ways been resigned to history are brought back. They're changed for the better. As I've seen the Friends of Blair Mountain write online, and as I've seen thematically throughout Chuck's book, their ancestors had a story that they thought we all should hear, and I agree. In this period of labor resurgence in the United States, you cannot place a high enough price on this work. Everyone should seek to do the same for their community's histories. Please read this book. There is a clearly motivating and compelling argument for a contemporary labor history here. You know, one that's centered on public history and advocacy, and it crosses traditional demarcations in the social world to intersect on the shared struggles in work and labor. That is, in my opinion, as it's, it's as much trans-historical as it is evident of specific material condition. It's a big deal. But even more powerfully, Chuck Keeney's story is a useful demonstration of how memory uniquely renders history in motion, rather than as purely stuff by and of the past. How when groups of people incorporate to take on a struggle larger than their atomized self, this stuff of the past catalyzes a vision of the future and comes crashing into the present moment for human agents to forge into weaponry, how both past and future can be the product of prolonged fights for change by those who choose to accept the struggle and its potential consequences. In the case of preserving a battlefield in West Virginia coal country, in the case of those who fought on that mountain, and for those who recognize their minor struggle as their own, and vice versa, a struggle that continues today at Warrior Met, in the workers' revolutionary recognition of their inability to make change on their own, we can conclude that it's those who stood and fought who shine brightly as a symbol of the universalizing potential of historic struggle and the memorialization of that struggle. The social contract and function of memory means that we must fight to preserve our place in history, and as an affective being that moves throughout the world, I will inevitably find myself the chance to prove my worth as part of the magnificent, menacing threat of revolutionary collectivity that stands as a towering public memorial cast in blood and lead.